uh, to be here. It's an absolute privilege. Couple of things. One is there's no quote that goes, don't ever try to climb over a wall leaning towards you or kiss a woman leaning away from you or talk to an audience about a subject they probably know more about. So I wanted to start with an anecdote from Lincoln that I thought would be appropriate and one I'm sure you've probably heard because he remains and, and the fact that you're associated with the university that is based upon the principles of him uh, in itself is testimony to a whole host of things. So I suspect you had more Lincoln on leadership and every other thing in the world, but it's true. One of my favorite ones though was uh, Abraham Lincoln would often talk about because didn't matter, he never let his sense of humor disappear, no matter how difficult things became. And one of them was he was accused of being such a common looking person. And he would say to someone, he said, you know, I had a dream where someone was talking about me and said, he's such a common looking person. And he said, and I love my retort. My retort was, uh, well, God loves common looking people. That's why he made so many of us. Uh, what I want to do is share something that's very common, that's just common sense, I think, that in a framework that you can use, whether you're an instructor here, whether you lead an organization, I want to give you a framework that I think will work. Now, I want to start with, uh, let me ask in the back, is this, is this too loud? Okay. Uh, I want to start with a, a story, an illustration, and an example. Now, the story is this. Uh, I was listening to Paul Harvey a number of years ago. I miss Paul Harvey, but I used to love those uh, clips that he would give. But he was telling a story about a father, and the father lived on the East Coast. His daughter went to college on the West Coast. But it was her fifth year. He rarely heard from her, except for, well, no regular requests for money. So finally, he wrote her and said, you know, unless you check in with me, I'm not going to send you another check. You didn't come home with Thanksgiving, you didn't come home with Christmas, and I don't know what you're doing. So unless you check in, I'm not sending any more money. Well, sure enough, he gets a note shortly after that, Dear Dad, I'm so sorry I haven't written you, but I'll catch up with you right now. I'm recovering quite nicely since the accident with Robert. Robert's the boy I've been living with for the last six months, and just as soon as we get his bankruptcy loan repaid, we'll both be back in school. I also wanted to share news of the new arrival later this spring. I'll make sure and call you when the baby gets here. Love, your daughter. P.S. None of the above is true, but I got a D in history and an F in Spanish, and I thought this might help put it in perspective. <laughs> what I want to offer are some perspectives that are impacting what we're doing. <clears throat> now, the other thing, and for the, I think you have enough room to do it, my illustration is this. Uh, take your index finger and put it up in the air. Now I want you to take your right foot. And with your right foot, I want you to get your right foot going in a clockwise direction. Get your foot in a clockwise direction. Keep it going. Index finger up here, because I'm going to ask you to do something. Foot moving clockwise. Now I want you to draw the number six. Okay? All right, now, my point here is, there isn't anything that I'm going to share with you that won't align and won't fit. Because one thing you try to do is to make coherence out of so many things out there so that they work. And it's easy to talk about. It's sometimes very, very, very hard to do. The, uh, uh, and one last one I want to share is when I was uh, county superintendent in Ohio, we had a large office building uh, in a medium-sized city. And when you got off the interstate, there was a large parking lot there. Now, we shared this large uh, multi-story office building with uh, Children's Services, the county health department. And sometimes if you didn't get there early, it was difficult to find a place to park because there were so many trainings that were going on. One morning, I get there about 10 o'clock, and I can't find a place to park. There were several trainings going on. I knew there were people waiting to meet with me. And I don't know if you do this or not. I still do this when I can't find a place to park. I just invent a spot. Now, I don't know if you've ever invented a spot, but the, the great invented spots are if this is the last line in the last car, you park right here. So at least half your car is on a line. Now, there's not one here. Now, the invented spots have already been taken. 
So I found an invented spot next to an invented spot, sort of in the back, and I thought, this will work. Fire trucks can get through here. No problem. I parked there, got out of my black car, went in the building, never thought about my car all day long. Met the group, had a good meeting. I remember it was one of those beautiful October evenings. I get on the elevator, I come down, and there's some young man from the health department walking out. We go out the sliding glass doors, head to the parking lot. Now the parking lot is virtually deserted, except for my black car, which is two spots out from the nearest parking spot, and all the rest are empty. I see this young guy looking at my car. I said, why do you suppose somebody would park like that? He said, I don't know, drunk or stupid. <laughs> now at that point, I didn't tell him, and that was my car. I stood at the end of the sidewalk and pretended to be waiting for a ride. <laughs> but I laughed. <clears throat> at 10 o'clock in the morning, that was resourceful. And at 6 o'clock in the evening, it was something different. And what we have to figure out in this world that is so rapidly changing, uh, what things are at 10 o'clock and what's at 6 o'clock and what are the things that we need to change and the things we should never change and the things we must change. And it's easy to describe that as a concept, but it's harder to do that. Uh, here's the frame I want to use. Uh, several years ago, I was asked to make an address at the beginning of school uh, to a group of teachers in the school district. And a movie had just come out and it was based on a book. Now, I didn't see the movie or the book. Some of you, I'm sure, have. It was called Eat, Pray, Love. It was by Elizabeth Gilbert. Now, I'm told it's this self-deprecating story of a young lady who finds great food in Italy, uh, a love interest in Bali, and spirituality in India. I think I have that right. And so I thought, I'm going to call a teacher friend and say, if your classroom were going to be three verbs at the end of the year, and you had to give evidence for the three verbs you think your classroom is about, what would your three verbs be? And the first person I talked to said, well, mine would be observe, learn, apply. And then I asked somebody else, and they said assess, align, achieve. Now I was kind of curious how many I'd have to call before somebody used the same verb. Now it was almost a game. I will tell you, number nine, I had 24 verbs before I got to someone using the same verb. And then I was struck by the idea, how you see your job, how you think about your job, is how you do your job. Think for a minute what your three verbs would be for your organization, for you that at the end, that if yours was motivate, what evidence would you in fact present that you had motivated people? Or if yours were engage, what is it that you would do? You get the idea. Now, I also noticed, then I started seeing just this mystical power of three. Uh, because there is a mystical power of three in communication and every other piece. And then I start to see things like that. I go to Ohio State games, and I remember right after that, they still have this large truck where I go. It's a pizza truck, and it says, order, pay, leave. They were doing the same thing. Mm! But you see these. So you begin to think, what are your three verbs? Now, I don't know what uh, the right, because there are no right three, but I'm going to share three with you uh, this morning, because these are the three that I'm picking, but I want you to think about what your three would be, because it helps frame what you do. I'm going to pick no, K-N-O-W, grow, and cultivate. So I just want to take those three themes for a minute. And I want to start with the no. That's this whole context piece. I want you to think that in the 15th century, when the ships came over, then what happened is goods became mobile. Then by the 17th century, with modern banking practices began to be instituted, capital became mobile. And we've seen in the last 25 years that labor has become very mobile. And we see these incredible changes in the context. Michael had mentioned, it's been my privilege to go to Hong Kong now in China probably a dozen times. And I'm always struck by the changes and all that I see. But I'll encapsulate one piece very quickly in a classroom where I was, where I passed out bookmarks to kindergartners. These were bookmarks that students had made in the classroom in Ohio, and I passed those out. 
And there was a little kindergartner who looked at me and she said, would you like for me to make a bookmark that you could take back and give to one of your students? And I said, that'd be great. I would like that. And then she said to me, do you want it in English or Chinese? And then I was struck by the largest English-speaking country in the world, of course, isn't us now. It's India. But it won't be India someday either. And it was this notion that very quickly our kids are growing up in a world that is so far connected that we can only imagine the possibilities. Now, I'll just give you one last example. One of my early trips there, I was having trouble making the computer work. And there was a young Chinese uh, individual with me when we were in the northern part, and he couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Cantonese, and finally, uh, I wasn't sure what to do, and he offered me his phone. He goes, 001. Now, I'm thinking 001 must be America. So I take his phone, 001, 614-472-3991, my tech director's number. Why not? Sure enough, brr, brr. hello? John, is that you? Yeah, Jim, I thought you were in China. I said, I am. I said, I can't get this Apple computer to open up. And he helped me, and we laughed, and then I hung up, and then I thought that here I was using this handheld device to talk to somebody very clearly 8,000 miles away to open up a computer to get to a program none of which was even remotely possible to have thought about when I was a kid growing up in a rural part of Ohio. Because China would have been chapter 7 in the social studies book. It would have been, our neighbors to the east. And that would have been pretty much it. Now you think about how fast the pace of change has become that preparing our kids for a world that's very, very difficult for us to imagine. Now, I want to give you just a few examples because you know this context really is important. Uh, I'll probably mispronounce his name, but you can look this up. I was telling Terry about this this morning. There's uh, uh, the winning TED Talk in education this last February was delivered by an Indian, Shugutra Mitra. Uh, has anybody seen this? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the uh, Hole in the Wall Project. And it's a very compelling talk, is it not? It is thought-provoking. He makes the assertion that knowledge is absolutely obsolete. And then he gives evidence for why that is true. And you cannot help but watch that and think, wow, the world is changing. Or as Thomas Friedman writes, when exceptional is readily available, average is out. Why is that Harvard, the undergraduates, take accounting courses from a professor from BYU because he's incredibly compelling and they don't have anyone who can do it as well so they simply outsource it if you will to BYU now this has implications for all of us and it would be ridiculous for me to outline the implications because I don't know what they are and I suggest neither to you but they are going to impact us and those are conversations we begin to think about how will this work what impact might this have? How do I do something that could be incredibly different? And how do we make ourselves continuously relevant? If somebody had told you Kodak that just 12 years ago had 175,000 employees and was a company 110 years old formed by George Eastman, that would have they would have declared bankruptcy because the very technology and innovation that they created, they didn't use. And I could go through just all of the, because creation also has a destructive side. And part of that is we begin to think how we serve our kids. The more you know and begin to think about how powerful it really is. Uh, and we think about how is it we really know our kids. I have to tell you, I went to Jiffy Lube the other day and I thought, this guy knows more about my car than many schools know about their kids. And there's something wrong when Jiffy Lube knows more. And it's not a criticism of schools, it's just true. Uh, he didn't have any problem bringing up a data piece right there, personalized computer. He had the history of my car. He knew what my car needed, didn't need, might need, all of those things. And those things matter. So when you begin to think about knowing, it does. 
The other part, Gallup has done a world poll for years. And the world poll is nearly 200 countries. And as they do their random sampling, the number one theme in the world is this, that we all have in common. Everybody wants a good job. Everybody wants a good job. That's not just a East Tennessee notion or an Ohio nation or a U.S. or anything like that. It really matters. So how is it we do that? Uh, last year, we helped to coordinate and sponsor trips to the highest performing countries' systems in the world. And I could do a whole lecture on that, I won't, but I'll just tell you very quickly a couple of pieces that I think are appropriate here. You go to our website and you can see it, but we sent teams to Hong Kong, we sent teams to Singapore, we sent teams to Finland, Ontario, Canada, and interestingly enough, Long Beach, California. Using PISA data, TIMS data, et cetera, over the last 15 years, these systems have shown themselves to be incredibly adept at superior student gains and high achievement despite a whole host of things. I went to Finland and one of the things that I was struck by in meeting with the principal who was talking about his school and showing us, he said to me, you have an expression in America, don't you? He said, leave no child behind. He said, it seems to me you guys say it, but here we believe it. Now, that, that's a powerful statement for somebody to say. And then we began to see over and over again, there was a personalized pathway for the success of each child. Now, I don't know how many kids are in Tennessee, what percentage they represent of the population. Let's say it's 20%. Whatever it is, if they represent 20% of the population, they represent 100% of the future. And the idea of creating a personalized path, part of what they do is this. 50% of the kids go to what's called upper Comprehensive high school, 50% will go to a vocational high school. There's equal respect for the choices kids make based upon their interest, aptitudes, <clears throat> skills. And then the same thing happens as they move and matriculate to the university, whether you go to a vocational university or a traditional university. But one thing they are able to do to ensure this individual pathway, they connect the jobs market, if you will, with the vocational programs. So we are training you for something that we believe offers opportunities. So this personalized your skills, aptitudes, and now we're also matching that up with the market. And we're doing this not just in K-12, but we've extended the university. And I begin to think about in people's lives, lots of things happen. We need lots of on and off ramps between preschool and forever because the currency of the future is going to be about learning. It's going to be, what do you know? What can you do? How might you be credentialed to demonstrate that? And how do we create a system that is not about separate entities, but about a continuous stream of learning? That's part of the challenge. So I offer just some of those uh, in terms of knowing, but the idea if we hope to, and I grew up in very much a rural area, and it's interesting because in 1965 under LBJ, the Higher Education Act, was they saw this huge gap between the highly educated and the less educated. And I can tell you that in 1970, that gap was predicted and was reported to be at 5%, and today that gap is larger than ever before. And it helps to translate into the haves and the have-nots. And so it's a moral imperative too. If we hope to help the next generation of kids, this whole learning pipeline, how we do it. So there's the no part, because understanding the environment that you live in is very, very powerful if you're gonna do something about it. So that we think about career ready. Now, I'm going to try something here in this next one. And before I do, I want to tell a story about Sven Nader. Now, some of you may know Sven Nader. Uh, anybody know that name? Okay. Uh, Sven Nader, in 1970, was a gangly college student in Southern California. And he wanted to play basketball at the premier basketball university at that time, UCLA. And he was a tall kid. 
He had grown to 6'10". And the coach was John Wooden. And John Wooden informed him, we have a center. Bill Walton's going to be our center for the next three years. But this kid really wanted to play there, and he was very good. And Wooden said to him, so I'll tell you what, I'll offer you a scholarship, but I need to make a promise to you. You may never play in a game. You may never play. And you could go to so many universities and play, but you may never play in a game here. But what I will promise you is you'll play against the best players in practice every night. So you have to decide if this is what you want to do, or I help you go somewhere else where you can play and start and be a star. Well, Sven Nader stayed at UCLA. He never started a game, ever. He left with three NCAA Division I men's champion basketball rings. And he was the first player ever drafted in the NBA in the first round who had never started a college basketball game. And he had a great career in the NBA, and he's a Costco executive now. My point of this is the value of association, who you associate with, and the degree to which we put groups together to associate and to learn from each other is very, very powerful. Now, I want to try something because I want to give you a framework, and this is the, uh, the GROW framework. So see if this, this makes sense to you. Uh, and one other value of association that I want to share because of our rural nature here and one of our emphasis at Patel for Kids has been to round up rural areas in a way so that they can become greater advocates for the unique problems they face with kids. We have what's called the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative. And again, you can read more about it if you wanted to and we're happy to share, but it's 21 very, very poor school districts that are in the 32 counties of Ohio that are designated federally as App the Appalachian region. Uh, and when you take those 21 school districts, they banded together that value of association for four or five reasons. One is they wanted to stay ahead of the curve. I used to tell people it's better to be one step ahead and leading than two steps ahead and being chased. So part of it is understanding the environment in which you live in. You don't have to like it. I love what Harry Truman said, I don't give people hell, I just tell them the truth and it sounds like hell. Uh, and we have some of that, but it's better to know it. But staying ahead of the curve is part of their discussions. So they'll look at videos, they'll share. It's about where is the world going? If we're going to stay ahead of the curve, we need to figure out where it is now and where it might go. One of the challenges for rural schools, and we talked about this this morning, is the notion that Rural schools have largely been protected by geography from charter schools, from that particular choice. Parents aren't going to sit, put their kids on a bus to go 40 miles to a STEM school, regardless how good it is. Now, I completely support choices, so I need to say that. But rural schools have largely been immune to other choices because of geography. That is about to dramatically change, not just for rural schools, for colleges for everybody because we have an infiltration of a virtual world now. When somebody tells me that there are now more people on Second Life than there are people who live in certain states, I can't, you see the richness of what this is. So the idea of creating compelling, engaging, interesting online learning that leads to certificates and skills People are invading that space. And then you begin to ask yourself, should we be in that space? How might we cooperate with others to do that? At the OAC, they've created a virtual high school now. Because if I have a physics teacher who's very, very good, who's highly effective, the chances are that there are 12 rural schools, or in this case, 21, who all have that same high caliber physics teacher. It's just simply not true. How do we leverage that physics teacher online to help other kids? So they've begun to do this. So you get the idea because the world is dramatically changing. When you look at the online classes that are now offered in higher education, there's a question of how is this going to work? What's going to be the business model for people who want to do this for profit? What's going to be, and I would always argue the degree to which we can come back and circle this and share our collective strengths, we can become better. So the OAC does that. <clears throat> the other thing, in addition to learning and sharing, it matters. 
ideas are very, very powerful. If you and I trade a dollar, we still have a dollar. Uh, but if you and I trade an idea, we each have two ideas. So the power of ideas is absolutely essential, and it gives us a way which, which to share those. And the other thing is, uh, there's a wonderful story I read in a Texas newspaper probably a dozen years ago. It was about a bull that had broken through a large plate glass window at a hollow dome. True story. <laughs> the bull goes crashing through the large plate gas window. I envision people sitting around drinking margaritas or whatever, and this bull comes charging in. Now, fortunately, the bull went right in the swimming pool. So everybody's safe. Quick-thinking manager drains all the water out. Now you just have this bull, the swimming pool. They're all looking down at this. They call 911. Fire department shows up. Fire department's debating exactly what to do with this. A rancher heard this on his scanner. It's absolutely true. Rancher comes over and said, you boys need some help with this bull? Yeah, we do. He takes a couple of two by sixes, he places them in the pool, walks down, puts a halter around the bull, leads the bull up the two by sixes, leads the bull out to his Ford pickup truck where he has a couple of other two by sixes, leads it up there, slides the boards in, shuts the gates, and tailgate, what do you want me to do with this bull? That is exactly what happened. Now there's a moral to this story in my opinion. The moral is not for every complex problem, there's a simple solution, because you know that's not true. But here is the moral. If you have a bull problem, get somebody who knows something about bulls. If we are going to solve educational challenges, we need to get the people who work in this. Because collectively, the expertise that you all have is huge. But then we have to have the willingness and the courage to challenge, to argue about, and then to do things differently. And the status quo is very, very difficult. But this notion about others have to do it makes no sense to me. Makes a great deal more sense that let's circle the wagons and figure out how we can make something work. So the OAC has done that. And then you just influence people and you share resources. In rural schools where suddenly now we have those that represent 35,000 kids in our case, we're now the third largest school district in Ohio. So whether it's testing companies, uh, technology companies, it's, wait a minute, uh, we would expect that you would give us the same price as you would give those, so there's just the resources savings. So there's a, there's a ton of advantages to that. I mean, what was it they asked uh, Willie uh, Sutton, the bank robber, Willie, how come you rob banks? Willie said, because that's where the money is. So the idea about finding how is it we make this work. Now, I promise you a framework, and, but I need your participation, and I promise not to embarrass anybody because I'm going to demonstrate something to you that I promise you when you leave here you can use. Uh, they asked uh, Charles Mayo, uh, founder of the Mayo Clinic, they said, what's the best advice you'd ever give to a new doctor? This is at the end of his career, and he thought for a minute, and he said, uh, here's what I'd tell him. I'd say... Try to imagine you were a patient. What kind of a doctor would you want? And then try to be that kind of doctor. And makes pretty much sense for any profession. Now, some of you are old enough. I bet you remember arena scheduling. High schools used to do arena scheduling. Now, for those who don't know what it is, arena scheduling would be we bring all the sophomores down. And all the sophomores to be juniors... All the teachers they would have for those junior classes would be there, so they'd go sign up for those classes, and you could create the master schedule uh, in a couple of hours for each class. This is how we did it. Now, if you ever got in the middle of those kids, and I have years ago, I never heard a sophomore to a junior say, well, I had Algebra one as a freshman, I had geometry as a sophomore, and I want to build upon that strong mathematical foundation, so I'll be looking for Algebra two. Kids didn't say that. They didn't sign up for courses. What do you think kids signed up for? Teachers! Absolutely! That's who they signed up for. So a fair question, would you want to have you for a teacher? That's a fair question to ask and you think about all those. So I'm going to give you a framework and I'll show you how this works. Now, here's where I need your participation and to make it really simple and less time consuming. Everybody in the back row if you would just come down here. 
Now, you can pass. It's okay. I promise not to embarrass you, but I just need you to come down here. Everybody in this back row, with the exception of you. Everybody in the, the back row. This is sort of like church. I knew I shouldn't have sat in this back row. Yeah, everybody in the back row. We need everybody in this whole back row. Okay. Now, while they're coming down, here's what I'm going to do. I have a deck of cards. Now, these cards have descriptions on them. For example, listening to coworker concerns, maintaining profit focus. What they represent, it was created by Professor Robert Quinn at the University of Michigan, Ross School of Business. These 52 cards are illustrative of what highly effective organizations do. Now, we're going to make this transference. He has spent his life writing books and studying highly effective organizations and highly effective leaders. Now, I'm going to transfer this to education in a minute, but for now, I'm going to give each of you a couple of these cards. Now, you may get something here. Uh, it might have managing projects. You think, oh, my God, I'd rather do anything but manage projects. And that's okay, because I'm going to give you a couple, and then I'm going to give you, after everybody has a couple, you can trade with anybody you want, because I want you to get something you'd really like. And not all of these are likable in here, okay, for everybody. So let me pass these out. Then after they're passed out, I'll give you a couple minutes. Trade with anybody you want to get a couple that you really like. Now, here's what I want you to do while you're sitting here. And I'm going to make this transference. I want you for a minute to jot down and then talk to the person next to you. What are the five most important, and I'll let you define these, behaviors, characteristics, traits of really great teachers. Forget the level, doesn't matter. What is it you think great teachers do, are, however you want to describe them, but I want five descriptions of what you think great teachers do. Now these I'm going to pass out, and then I'm going to give you a couple minutes to trade with anybody you want. So, let me just pass these really quickly. And there we go. Give you an extra one. Oh, yay. There we go. You do now. More to trade. There we go. Here we go. Here's here's another one. Maybe a final one here. There you go. Okay, you go ahead and trade with whoever you want. Get a couple you like. <clears throat> here, maybe here's one you like.
Okay, about another 30 seconds. Get a couple that you like. Okay, now, here's what I want you to do. If you'll notice on the cards that I gave you, they have a colored border. So, I want you to put your favorite activity on top, and I want you to see what color it is. Now, you may have both your cards, or in some cases, all three cards may be the same color. That's okay, too. But you may have a mixed bag, and that's all right. But pick the color on top that is your most preferred activity, okay? Now, if it's yellow, I want you to come here. And if it's blue, I want you to go back there closer to the exit sign. Okay, if it's blue, back there. The color around it is blue. We have some blues, there have to be some blues. There have to be some blues, okay? All right. <laughs> if it's red, right here, red. And if it's green, back there. Oh, no. <laughs> now, you know what? This is sort of interesting. Now, after I explain this, this is really pretty interesting. If you have a second one that is blue, I want you to join this person. If your second one is blue. Oh, good. Keep in mind, this was not a preference. But I, this will make sense here. It's interesting. All right. There's a lot that are close. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask them to read these cards. You have, it's yellow now, green. Green. Yours is yellow. All right. Let's read these yellow cards. If you have more than one, I want you to read them. Okay? And I want you to listen to the theme and associate this theme with yellow. Okay. Sharing information with others. Do you have any other yellow ones? Okay. Increasing morale. Facilitating teamwork and cooperation. Okay. We lost a lot of yellow over here that was your first one. If you have a yellow first one over there, I want you to read yours. Okay, now that's this yellow group. Okay, now what's the theme to that yellow group? Touchy feeling. A lot of people say that. It's HR, it's relationships. Maybe at its very worst, it's that, but it's very much relationship oriented. And you could say yellow is very, very powerful. Now, Let's take the blue back here, and I want you to list the blue. And we had to get people back here to get in blue. But read just the blue ones now. Maintaining profit focus. Delivering results quickly. Driving through barriers. Making decisions quickly. Setting short-term objectives. Being a decisive decision maker. Emphasizing competitiveness. Focusing on goal attainment. Emphasizing short time to market. What's blue about? <laughs> Maybe movers and shakers. What else is blue about? <laughs> Decisions. Getting it done. It's results. It is results. Blue is about results. Yellow is about relationships. Now, sometimes at complete odds, at complete odds, sometimes, and actually somebody here said it, Sometimes people who have a strong emphasis in blue look at people in yellow, and at their worst, what do the blues say about the yellows? They're what? It is. They're touchy-feely. They want to have a meeting. They all want to get together. <laughs> Let's hold hands. You know, you get the idea. And at their very worst, this group looks at the blue, and what do they say? At their worst. They don't care about people. What else? Yeah, you don't tell me about the labor pains. Bring me the baby. You know, this is the group here. They make it a sweatshop. 
All you care about is results, results. Now, at their worst, now, it's all going to come around. So yellow is very much about relationships. It's about collaboration. Blue is about results, outcomes, uh, goal focus. All right, now, let's take green and uh, red. Now, yours is red, right? Okay, I want you to read the red ones. Improving processes. Managing projects. Cutting costs. I have to. Lowering risk exposure for the organization and maintaining professional standards. We've got two. Meeting quality specifications and implementing controls to minimize waste and fraud. Establishing procedures. Increasing productivity. Okay, what's red about? It's about efficiency. What else? Management, control, structure, very much. It's about processes to ensure. Look, if I get a cup of coffee at McDonald's in Knoxville or I get it in Hong Kong, it tastes the same, looks the same, because they have processes that ensure it's made the same way. They use the same ingredients. Uh, I guarantee in a school environment, these are the people that say, do you have a purchase order for that? <laughs> it's, it's, it's very much about processes and structures, okay? It makes sense. All right, now, let's take, let's take green. All right, how about the green ones? Emphasizing flexibility and adaptability and generating new ideas. Articulating future possibilities for the organization, anticipating what the customer wants next, brainstorming. Starting creative experiments. What's green about for a company? Visionaries, what else? Huh? Future? Exploration, innovation, most companies, this would be R&D, very much. Now the R&D folks, when you look at the red folks at their worst, what do you say about them? They get in the way. They get in the way. It's like, oh my God, are you going to put a structure around this? Can't we just talk? You know, they want to take notes. They want to. Now, at their very worst, what do you see these people? They waste time. They waste time. Oh my God, it's chaos. Let's be honest. They waste time. They suck more time away. And it's like, can't you get organized? Here's how we do this. They take the two hour lunch break. They take the two. Now, here's what Quinn has developed this framework. This framework is one of the 25 most influential frameworks ever developed. It's a universal framework on competing values. Now, Quinn has written books about this, but I'll tell you the interesting thing Quinn has done now for the last four years. He has worked with us, and his next book is going to be with a couple of our people called Highly Effective Teachers. Because he came down, and guess what? He interviewed lots of highly effective teachers uh, that had been identified and from Tennessee, Texas, and Ohio. And what's interesting, he said, this is the same model for CEOs. They are CEOs of highly complex organizations. Now, let's just transfer this to education because you see it very quickly. The reason there were so many people to begin with in yellow, and a bunch of them moved because I forced you, because yellow is about building relationships. Most people who go into education want to build relationships. They like kids. So it makes sense they want to build relationships and know how to build relationships. Uh, now I will tell you, there are those people who, you remember these, I remember when I started teaching. Don't smile till Christmas. You know what I've learned in 40 years? The people that don't smile before Christmas, hell, they don't smile after Christmas either. <laughs> Building relationships matter. It's very, very powerful. Now, sometimes at odds is this idea of results. If carried to extreme. If carried to extreme, results is, well, welcome to the sweatshop. You don't have to like it here, da 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 all those things. And I would argue, what good is it for a kid to make three years of math progress if they never want to do another math problem the rest of their life. Now, what Quinn says is effective organizations do all of these, 
The power is integrating them. You need to do all of these. It's not one or the other. Do we have things that we like and come easier to us than others? Absolutely. And we need to use those to lever the others. For example, there are people who build great relationships with kids. Will kids work harder for somebody they think likes them? Like, like them? Duh. Absolutely. But carried to extremes? I bet you know some of these, too. Oh, I just love the kids. They don't learn anything, but I love them. <laughs> And we know the extremes over here. It is not about the tyranny of or. It's about the brilliance of and. It's integrating these. So you need relationships and you absolutely need outcomes. Outcomes matter. Kids have to be able to do things. Now, let's take these last two. Because if we go to green, green's very much about creativity. There are some people that are blessed as teachers with incredible creativity and administrators who look at time differently. They take a project, how can I make this the most interesting, relevant project that kids ever had? I used to uh, meet with seniors in our high school because we'd have about 250 and I'd meet with them over a two-day period. Now, I'll tell you the truth. I never told anybody in the school district the real truth. What I told people, the reason I wanted to meet with them, I had two or three questions. I just wanted to talk to each kid before they graduated. The real reason was I went to graduation and I thought, I know you if you've been an athlete. I know you if you've been in the music competition. I know if you've been suspended. I really know you if you've been expelled. But if you've just done your job, I may not know you. And there's something symbolically about when you walk across that stage and I shake hands with you that I can look at you and say, well, good luck with the Army or whatever you're going to do. That's the real reason, because symbolically, you mattered. And it was not me, it was the position that I represented. But I used to ask the kids, I'd have three questions for them that were really pretty simple. I'd say, tell me about the best learning experience you ever had in this school system, ever. I can tell you over and over again, the ideas they gave me came from the green people. They're the ones who, oh my God, we all got dressed up. We had these foods. We went out. We did this. We did fractions in the snow. We did, it, it was those things where they're looking at, how is it that we might take this unit that could be relevant and creative? It mattered. Now, the red group, I can tell you this. The red group in a classroom is hugely powerful. The red skills. A new teacher today still has to wrestle with classroom management, and so did I. You have to figure out how it works. This is about having structures. There are structures, and I watch high school teachers who may have the ACT question of the week, of the day rather, that immediately gets kids. It's a technique for managing and getting kids immediately to work. There are certain pieces that teachers, because if you don't have order and there isn't some kind of structure, I, and you, you're totally in green, you start in green, you'll never get to blue, trust me. You'll never get to blue. So it's about having all of these. This connect framework is very powerful. Now you begin to think about as an organization, what do we do to actively engage innovation? Who are the people who are incredibly creative? Why don't we have them working on things that could benefit all of us? By the same thing, Effective organizations have to have structure. You cannot have total chaos all the time. It doesn't work. We need to have outcomes. We need to have results so we can report. You cannot improve a goal you don't measure. Worse yet, you can't improve one you don't have. So the idea of having goals that we reach, we measure our progress along the way, really matters. And it's about relationships. It's about people. If you ask most people who retire, and I talked to a lot of my friends who have started to retire, and I said, what do you miss? They don't miss structure, but the organization wouldn't have been effective without, instruction, without structure. They miss this piece here. It's about relationships. So these four quadrants, these are not just an interesting idea. What Quinn has shown unequivocally is successful CEOs, Successful teachers, we would add. Effective organizations pay attention to all four of these things. They care about the people and the relationships. Because last time I checked, there is no 
followership without leadership. And leadership that completely ignores people eventually will be in trouble. So you can get out of balance here with being so, so powerful on results. Oftentimes we can get short-term results. Trust me, there's, I, the world is littered with CEOs who came in very quickly, made all the cuts necessary, raised up the price of the value of the stock, and did nothing to improve the real value of the company. So having results matters. The degree to which we integrate these is what's so powerful. Does this make sense to you? Uh, the Connect framework, I think, is really a powerful one for any organization when you begin to think, and it gives us a language to talk about it without being offensive. To where now it's like, here, I have this new form for you. Oh, hey, I'm just carrying out my red function, and we all need a little bit of red here, or this isn't going to work. You get the idea. And having goals and outcomes, and not just what the state or someone does for you. What is it we think? should be our legitimate outcomes. So it's a powerful framework that you can use with your own teaching. Say, what is it? Which is my preference? We have a little survey that gives you your preference because any one of these, your preference can use you, can use, be used to integrate the other ones very powerfully. So our last row will give you a hand. If somebody from each group would collect all the cards, I'll take the cards back. Thank you. Did that make sense to you? It's a powerful framework and for an improvement that gives people a way to talk about it too. Now, within that, I can tell you, I've done this with countless teachers, takes large teacher groups, and I'd say, okay, give me your five best yellow practices. Teachers can do that. Give me your five best red practices. Give me your five best blue practices. Uh, these matter. These matter because they're not all equal. There are some things that are more effective than others. So it's about growing, getting better. The biggest room in any organization is the room for improvement. And how do we get better? That's a framework for helping you to think about your organization, whether it's the department, your classroom, whatever level, and how we do this. The last one is cultivate. It's about culture. Culture will trump strategy every day of the week. Culture matters. Culture is what you celebrate, how you interact, everything about stuff. Malcolm Gladwell in the book, The Outliers, tells a wonderful story about Rosetto, Pennsylvania. Rosetto, Pennsylvania is in the foothills of eastern Pennsylvania at the Appalachian Mountains, and it was settled there uh, in the early part of the 1900s by a group of Italians that had originally immigrated from Rosetto, Italy to Mulberry Street in New York City, and then a group went to eastern Pennsylvania and they renamed a town after a town in Italy, Rosetto, Pennsylvania. Now, fast forward to the 1950s, there was a physician, Stuart Wolf, who's talking to a sociologist. He said, you know what, it's a funny thing about this little town. Uh, I rarely treat anybody with heart disease who's under 55. Uh, I just don't have it. Guy was curious, followed up, it was true. Uh, they didn't get heart disease. Now, why was that? So they investigated it. So, well, these must be, in this little town, they must get up and jog and run, and they're exercise freaks. No, they didn't do that. Oh, they must not like Italian fare. No, of course they did. They ate pizza and sausage and all the other things and drank. I, I go through all these things that he investigated. There was an answer, and I'm going to get to the answer. Because they also, it must have been a gene. These folks had a special gene. Nope. There are friends and cousins and neighbors that went to other communities, died at the same rate, and had heart disease at the same rate. They had created a Paisan culture between school, church, family, community that was so powerful it served as an immunity against the normal, everyday stresses of life. That's how powerful culture is. So culture matters. So what do you enculturate? What do you cultivate? Uh, those things really matter. Uh, I'd already, another great book I would suggest to you is by Paul Tuff called How Children Succeed. I don't know if you've read this or not. But we followed up with him, and I've had a chance to talk to him. And 
Uh, Angela Duckworth from Penn State's another one because she's created a grit scale. I love this because it's what I used to tell kids. Look, your I do is every bit as important as your IQ. The only place that I've ever seen where success comes before work is in the dictionary. So perseverance, grit, effort, guess what? Those are as powerful predictors of success as ACD, all those others. You know that's true. You know that's true. And for most kids, if they will give you effort, you will give them the world. But they have to work at it. This isn't good enough. You can do better. I know. Now, think about this blue quad. Blue quad, I'm giving it back. John, is this your best work? Are you kidding me? I want you to look at this rubric. I want you to look at yours. Tell me how you can improve this. If I have a relationship with somebody, can I do that? Of course I can. You think of anybody that you've had a deep, powerful relationship with. Did they ever make you mad? I guarantee you they have. Did they expect something of you? Absolutely. Expectations are powerful. That's part of the culture too. People used to say to me when NCLB first came out, they said, you really think in 2014 kids will be 100% proficient? Well, we're almost there. I was right. I said, no, I don't. Now, there wasn't anybody with an ounce of sense that wouldn't have said, that isn't going to happen. But I said, I have to tell you, I don't quibble with the aspiration of it, though. Otherwise, do you want to have a school? Welcome to East Elementary School. Some of the kids here will learn. Maybe yours will be one of them. <laughs> Poor performance is not a sin, but low aim is. So aspirationally, that's what we ought to expect. So you think about what it is you expect. It's very, very powerful. It's part of the culture. So the things we do to build culture are the things that we cultivate. And I would argue out of these four colors, if it doesn't matter, you pick the reunion when people get back together. Uh, if we could take, uh, Terry, one of the school districts you work with, if the seniors right now, the class of 2014, get back together in 2044 and it's 30 years later, do you think they'll say, oh, I think that was the year that, right before the, the new Common Core standards, we had raised academic standards, they helped us pass tests. Yeah, yeah, that's not what kids talk about. You know what they talk about? They talk about the culture and the relationships and all those. That's not a reason to blow those off, but it's not the reason that people come back to remember. That's how powerful the culture is that people want to come back and remember. It's very powerful. And I'll finish with a, I was at a uh, lunch in Atlanta with a college professor. And he told me a story that was very powerful. And it had just happened, so he just had the need to tell somebody this. That's a great story. He had taught high school English in Pennsylvania. And then he went to NC State where he finished his PhD and he taught English at NC State. And he received a teaching award and there was a picture of him in the paper. And he gets a call from a young lady that said, uh, Dr. Such and Such, were you the same person that taught high school English in Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania 20 years ago? Yeah. Who are you? Well, I'm such and such. I'm married now, but oh, I remember you. And they made uh, reservations to have lunch together. Now he said, we start, I started thinking about that class. We all have those classes that we always want to remember. We have those we can't forget. Uh, and we remember when we first, that first group we always had, because if you're a teacher, long-range planning, if it's Tuesday, that would be Thursday. Uh, you're just trying to figure out if you can make the team here. And so they went. he goes to the luncheon, and he thought about that class, and he said one of the things, he said, I love that class. He said they were all seniors, and he said, we studied great books. This class loved to read and loved to talk. So we read great books and talked about them, and he said, I got a little carried away when they graduated for a graduation gift. I gave everybody a four-page handout that had 25 books that we didn't get to that you ought to read. <laughs> Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, short paragraph summarizing it. 25 books, four-page handout, that's what I gave him. Good luck. Now, I said, I meet with this young lady who's now in her early uh, 40s, and we talked, and we shared, and we caught up, and he said it was just wonderful. He said, then she did something that just took me back. She reached in her purse, she got out a four-page handout that was very old, had been folded and unfolded countless times, opened it up, and there were all kinds of little notes to the side, 
on all four pages, and she said, I read every one of these books. When do we get our next assignment? <laughs> this is the gift that keeps on giving. This is an influence that lasts a lifetime. And it's never just about outcomes. Outcomes matter, but so do relationships and structures that enable you to do it effectively and the power of ideas to enable us to do it differently in a world that is so dramatically changing. How is it that we can accommodate that and remain relevant and vital in all those things? So the last thing I want to say is on behalf of the thousands and thousands of kids whom you have had, currently have, and will have, they may not say it, but I'll say it for them. In absentia, thank you, because it matters. Thank you. Now, I think there's some time for questions or any comments that any of you may have about anything that I said that resonated or didn't resonate. That's okay, too. I mean, I used to suggest to somebody, if two people agree on everything, one of them's useless. If, if two people disagree on everything, they're both useless. Yes? Absolutely. There's no question about it. There's a real tension here. There's a real tension here. And the same way I, I've been associated with value added since we talked earlier, since I met Bill Sanders in Tennessee a number of years ago. And the problem is we have turned value added from a flashlight into a club. And the more we make it a club and the less we show light on it, we make people, and I'll use Ohio. And I've said this in Ohio, I've testified, I met with our education committee chair in the house, 50% of your evaluation in Ohio is related to value added. People are absolutely so afraid of the blue consequences here. And the conflict is, you know what I got into it, because I like kids. Uh, I have a daughter who's a third grade teacher. In Ohio, she has two things, value added scores, and now we have a law that says that if you don't pass the reading test at the end of third grade, you're retained. So there's, there's powerful disincentives to cause people who get into this. There's a wonderful study called A Sense of Calling, and the Public Agenda Foundation did it. And it absolutely asserts that the people who go into this is because they feel a real sense of calling about wanting to help young people. That's why they do it. And this notion about, uh, you know, those who can do, the, you that at the end of the day, I'd always remind those folks, well, if you think this is so easy, why don't you just join me on a warm, sunny afternoon? It's about 90 degrees. And the second floor of some junior high was seventh graders from 2.30 to 3 o'clock. And why don't you just help the kids to understand how to change decimals to fractions to percents? This is just so easy. Uh, it's incredibly challenging and difficult. But your point about this tension is absolutely real. And how do we get this balance? Because I'm convinced without accountability, some people would never do anything better. So having accountability, and I don't even like the term. I like the term ownership. Uh, but having ownership of kids is a good thing. But how do we also balance that with this other tension? Because that's a real one. Uh, other comments or questions that you may have about anything related to any of this? Pardon? Yeah, I, Oregon, statewide, we try to do it with policies. So part of it is, if I'm going to expect much in results, then I have to support much. Because to raise expectations without support is just a dream. And worse yet, to raise support without expectations is a waste of money. So if I'm going to expect you to do a better job, then I have an obligation to put in supports that help you do that. So that's how you could do it at a policy level. Sometimes on a personal level, I, I'll tell you what, one of the things uh, uh, that I did when uh, I coached high school, uh, I went from boys to a girls sport when they started. I'd never coached high school girls at a varsity sport. 
and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And they wanted me to do it because of the sport. Uh, I had coached baseball and played baseball, and they went to uh, fast pitch softball. Now, the reason I mention this is because the high school secretary was a lady who helped me, and she helped me when I got too far over here in the blue. And, and she would say, you know what, it's Friday, and the prom's tomorrow, and you can't keep them here forever. Uh, she helped me to balance. So sometimes it's just perspective because we can get so carried away with any one of these that it doesn't make sense. But having that, it's easy to talk about, but integrating that is everything. Other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Red works particularly for certain kinds of... I wouldn't want the treasurer's office to be green. Okay? Or as I used to tell the treasurer when I was superintendent, this thing really gets messed up, I get fired, you go to jail. Uh, I don't want green in the treasurer's office. Uh, but your point, I think, is absolutely well taken. But there are certain structures that we know regardless work with kids but one size certainly doesn't fit all and there's a wonderful piece written by jamie vollmer a former business education advocate now about blueberries which is all related to that so i amen i agree with you uh other questions thoughts suggestions from uh anything i might have said that might have prompted something okay I, you know what, I think, I think uh, we actually have education ones now. I used his because they are it's simpler. I'm almost sure. And if not, you, you go to our website. I'm sure they're on there. And if they aren't, you tell Joe T. And Joe T will get a hold of me, and I promise you, I'll get them for you. I promise you. There's some great education ones. And it just prompts great discussion about ideas uh, because we had a whole group of teachers make some of these on practices to uh, prompt the conversation. Any, anything else? Any other questions about anything? I tell you what, I, I really understand that. Uh, part of the reason I was so attracted to value added was that it leveled the playing field. Because teachers have kids who come to the third grade who know 20,000 words and can read books. And we have third graders who don't know all the colors in the primary coloring box and everything in between. So what we want to do is to raise kids level from wherever they are. But the notion about competing where we get into this is now in strategic compensation. Because the one thing we don't want to do is to ever tear up the culture of sharing. Because I'm not going to give you my best stuff because I'm now competing against you. Uh, and people do it differently. I'll give an example of uh, Fort Worth, Texas. We've worked with them and they put together a compensation system that only rewards teams because of their exact fear of that. Because it really can uh, carry to its extreme. It's just, it, it is destructive. And how is it that we still encourage and foster collaboration and sharing while at the same time uh, we're, we're in a competitive world? So, I, I mean, I think it's a, sometimes I say there are problems. Problems can be solved. Dilemmas can be worked at. And I look at that very much that way. I, but I think part of it is just recognizing that it's there and to deal with it openly uh, but I think yeah, your point's well taken. Any other things? Well, Michael, I just want to say I really, I apologize for abruptly leaving. Uh, I am uh, catching an international flight to Ireland. 
Uh, I love Ireland, and I can't miss this. This is a pure vacation. I don't do very often, but I am looking forward to it. But I wanted to come here, and I love Tennessee, and we are much more alike, I can tell you, across this country, but particularly in Ohio and Tennessee. Uh, we are much more alike than we are different, but it is always really a privilege for me uh, to come here. So I appreciate uh, being, being here and uh, being able to deliver a lecture around a university that has so much principle. So thank you very, very much.